Next on Currents News, nine key countries are on the verge of recession, driving fears the United States might be next. Today is one of the most holy days in the church calendar. Pope Francis blessing a special gift for Catholics in war-torn Syria. Israel has denied entry for two Democrat lawmakers, known for their criticism of the Jewish state's actions. Plus, I'm Tim Harfman in Brooklyn, where a Catholic academy is dedicating a brand new classroom to teaching students through their senses. That story is coming up. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Tamara Lane. Tonight we begin with news important to everyone, the economy. The markets closed mixed today after dramatic drop 24 hours ago. The wild ride on Wall Street is being propelled by fears of a global recession. Two of the three major indexes staged late day rallies to go higher. The Dow ended up almost 100 points, closing at 25,579. But the Nasdaq was down by more than seven, finishing at 7,766, while the S&P gained seven points, ending the day at 2847. The Wall Street jitters are being driven by shaky financial news from around the world. John Lawrence reports that data from overseas is impacting us at home. Some financial analysts fear a recession is looming. I think we are at the end of 10 years of easy money. Most dangerous moment in terms of recession since the 2008 financial crisis. Part of the concern comes from outside of the U.S. China and Germany both issued disappointing data this week, and banks in India, New Zealand, and Thailand slashed rates greater than expected due to trade fears. If we're not in recession globally, we're pretty close, and it's going to weigh on us here. The U.S. economy has seen record economic growth and a strong job market, but some say President Trump's trade war with China could cause a slowdown. If the president can't figure out a way to to find some kind of face-saving arrangement with, uh, with China pretty soon, we will be in recession. The president decided to delay tariffs against Beijing until December, and Wednesday he tweeted that China wants to make a deal. In the meantime, Americans are keeping a close watch on their wallets. U.S. consumers, who've been pretty robust, are, are actually starting to look a little weaker, cutting back credit card balances, scaling back on purchasing gasoline in the middle of a holiday vacation season. So there's all kinds of things that have been leading up to this. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Tonight, Israel is blocking two prominent U.S. Congresswomen from entering the country amid pressure by President Donald Trump. Representatives Rashida Tlaib and Elon Omar are being kept out of the Jewish state. The country's deputy foreign minister says it's because the pair deny Israel's right to exist. President Trump had tweeted earlier today that, quote, it would show great weakness if Israel allowed Representative Omar and Representative Tlaib to visit. They hate Israel and all Jewish people, and there is nothing that can be said or done to change their minds. The police commissioner of Philadelphia is praising God today, crediting the survival of his officers to divine intervention. After an hours-long standoff and shootout that left six officers shot and another injured, the top brass said it was nothing short of a miracle that the city doesn't have dead officers. Camila Bernal has the latest on the drug warrant that triggered the, ho the hostage situation. Panic in the streets of North Philadelphia Wednesday as bullets flew for hours. Police officers trying to serve a narcotics warrant entered a row house. And as they got to the kitchen area, they say 36-year-old Maurice Hill fired multiple rounds. But dealing with a violent felon who told me himself during negotiations that he had an extensive arrest record and that he did not want to deal with prison again. According to police, Hill barricaded himself inside for almost eight hours and continued shooting, trapping some officers in the house. By the time he surrendered, six officers had been injured. There are many heroes from last night, probably too many to mention by name. Certainly, you know of the six officers who were struck by gunfire. The shooting adding fuel to the gun control debate. We need to start with really good gun legislation. Let's take guns out of the hands of people like this. Uh, then they don't have the means to do the things that this jerk did last night. But
But President Trump had a different focus, tweeting the Philadelphia shooter should never have been allowed to be on the streets. He had a long and very dangerous criminal record. The president ending his tweet with a call to get tougher on street crime. Camila Bernal, Currents News. There's breaking news about assisted suicide in New Jersey. A judge is stopping the new law that allowed terminally ill patients to end their lives. The Catholic Church had strongly opposed the measure. The court is indicating it will further review the law in September. Around the world, Catholics are celebrating a holy day of obligation, the Feast of Mary's Assumption, when God took the Blessed Mother from earth into heaven. The Holy Father marked the occasion during his Angelus prayer at St. Peter's Square. Si perde dietro a tante piccolezze, Maria ci dimostra Pope Francis said Mary's assumption should remind us to put aside our insignificant and petty concerns and instead focus on God. He also made a call for peace, specifically in the Middle East. After the Angelus, the Holy Father blessed 6,000 rosaries that will be sent to Catholic communities in Syria. An update tonight on a frustrated Catholic cardinal and his demand for answers after Islamic militants bombed Catholic churches. The country's top prelate, Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith, is saying Parliament's investigation of the Easter Sunday terrorism is no good. He claims the politicians who looked into the attacks were wrapped up in protecting themselves rather than getting honest answers. He's insisting on an independent probe of the massacres. Jihadists bombed three churches and hotels, killing 263 people. The Cardinal also slammed the Sri Lankan government after it was learned that security officials had specific intelligence about the bombings before they occurred. For more on the Cardinal's continuing fight for justice, the national correspondent for The Tablet and Crux, Christopher White, joins us now. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the Cardinal is demanding an independent probe. Do you think he's going to get it? Well, the Cardinal has said that, you know, uh, this most recent push by himself alongside the country's bishops uh, has been met positively by the country's prime minister and said that they're open to this and they want to you know, work toward this. What we've seen since Easter Sunday is uh, a very loud uh, and, you know, continual cry from Cardinal Ranjith as, along with the other country bishops for this probe. They appear to be relentless, uh, and so I don't think they're going to back down. What's been the fallout from this? Have any of the country's top officials uh, been charged? Yeah, so we've seen the police commissioner who was suspended. Uh, the national security officer was also fired. Uh, then later they faced criminal charges. Uh, however, uh, they have been let out on bail, and so it sort of remains to be seen what their you know legal fate will be. What about the relationship? What about the relationship between Catholics and Muslims? Well, with Catholics and Muslims, you know, traditionally in Sri Lanka, they've enjoyed very friendly ties. They live in the same mm -hmm. villages and they, you know, they work alongside one another. And this is one of the things that Cardinal Ranjith has said has really devastated the community is the fact that they have lived alongside each other, conflict-free for so long, and they wanted to continue these strong bonds. There has been, he says, sort of an air of suspicion, uh, but he, his sort of line that he's reiterated over and over is that he doesn't want these strong ties to be severed, mm -hmm. uh, and so that, you know, Islamic extremism cannot win the day. And overall, how are Catholics in Sri Lanka faring at the moment? Um, and what about the very outspoken cardinal himself? Yeah, you know, when he talks about this, he still wells up with tears. It's still very emotional, you know, losing, you know, almost 300 Sri Lankans on, on Easter Sunday. Uh, they have begun to attend mass again. Uh, heightened security measures and protocols are in place. Uh, but it's, it's been a slow process. Uh, and, but they have said they've also received a lot of support from Sri Lankan Catholics outside of Sri Lanka, including here in the U.S., that have sort of expressed their solidarity, and that's been a way of sort of bolstering their spirits. Uh, and so I think gradually you see the country trying to get back to normal, uh, or at least a new normal. Uh, well, we'll keep our eye out for them. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, National Tamara. correspondent for The Tablet and Crux, Christopher White, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tamara. Worry is spreading throughout France tonight. Concerns growing over the rebuilding of the world's most famous cathedral. Several stones fell from the vaulted ceiling of the fire-ravaged Notre Dame late yesterday. Officials say the ceiling is still at risk of further damage and even possible collapse because of last month's European heat wave. They are now urging renewed stabilization efforts. Rebuilding is set to begin next week. 
Here in the Brooklyn Diocese, the construction of a special place that is the first of its kind. A new classroom with floors that change shapes and lights that shine bright. It's all dedicated to teaching kids through their senses. Currents News Tim Harfman has the story from Windsor Terrace. They have different textures, um, they feel different. From these rubber discs to squishy floor tiles. So you can step on them. It's a new way of shaping the young minds of kids between the ages of two and five. Sensory play really activates a whole different center of the brain that helps them really understand their entire world around them, starts to make sense of the world, and has them start to make their own definitions for what things are. Stephanie Ann German is the principal of St. Joseph the Worker Catholic Academy in Windsor Terrace. Her new classroom is the first in the diocese to instruct students using their senses. Nearly 80 kids are learning through this method. Things like this are just calming. When they get back to school, students will be working with a variety of unusual tools. And tables like this one highlight the new room. With the touch of a remote, the LED lights underneath change colors. Kids can explore that table. They can explore with shadows. What happens when I put something, my hand on the table? What happens when I put this block on the table? After years of teaching in the Brooklyn Diocese, Miss German's preparing for her first year as principal. I'm just really excited to get started with kids and engaging with families um, and getting to know more of the community. She's off to a fast start not only looking to make a difference with pre-K and kindergarten children, but students in other grades as well. Miss German's replacing these old desks with new ones, shaped as triangles. That will get the kids to connect. You have to put them together in different formations so it leads for collaborative peer learning. So whether you make squares or circles or long, like kind of long, tables, yeah. kids are going to be sitting with each other and not in isolated rows. These desks and hallways are empty now, but in three weeks, Miss German and her teachers will be ready. It's really good for kids, and at the end of the day, like we're here for kids, and we want them to benefit from everything we do. In the Brooklyn Diocese, the new school year begins Wednesday, September 4th. In Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn, Tim Harfman, Currents News. There's a lot more news headed your way. The statute of limitations previously put a time limit on sex abuse allegations. Now victims can bring lawsuits regardless of when the alleged abuse occurred. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio is in studio with the details. It's the country's busiest migrant facility. We get a rare inside look. 75 years after serving his country, one Catholic man is getting his high school diploma. I'm Emily Druby and that is ahead. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. There's news to report on this so-called look-back window of the Child Victims Act. When the Albany legislature passed the law, it lifted the statute of limitations to give child sex abuse survivors one year to sue their abusers, no matter when the wrongdoing happened. That went into effect yesterday. According to a court official, 169 cases were filed in the city and 258 more upstate. The defendants included Rockefeller University, the Boy Scouts, the church, and many public schools. Bishop DiMarzio is one of the nation's leading advocates for abuse survivors, creating many powerful programs for them in the Brooklyn Diocese. Now he's with Ed Wilkinson to talk about the look back window and an important alternative. Ed? Thank you. Today we're going to talk with Bishop DiMarzio about the recent lifting of the statute of limitations on sex abuse cases here in uh, New York State. Bishop, this week uh, the one year suspension of the statute of limitations went into effect where uh, people who were abused many, many years ago can bring forth their cases. And this affects churches, schools, all kinds of youth groups, what's going on. What do you think the, the effect on the diocese is going to be uh, during this one year look back period? Well, we really don't know. We have settled over 500 cases in the IRCP, which is the Independent Reconciliation Program. We would hope that more people would still use that because going to court is a whole different situation. In the IRCP, it's a non-adversarial situation. You have to bring the proof, but it's not something you're going to be questioned on. In court, you, you can bring the proof, and you need witnesses, and it's a higher uh, degree and level of uh, proof that's necessary to win a court case. And it really opens up old wounds again. 
because the RCP is very individual, it's very confidential. It's only the person uh, speaking to an attorney or filling out the forms themselves. So it's an easier uh, way to do it. But again, people, some people, they want their day in court. Well, the day in court is not an easy day. I mean, one, woman came, one man came to me and he said, well, you know, I didn't want to tell everything to the person because I was a, a kind of ashamed. I said, well, if you want to go to court, it's going to be worse. You have the jury there and people, and uh, it, this is much more of an easier way to try to heal, you know. So again, the people have to make their own decisions, but uh, from my point of view, I think this would be a better way than going uh, through a court system. Uh, when you first put this reconciliation program into place, you felt that there were a lot more people came forward than you thought were gonna come, right? That's for sure. We didn't realize there were that many uh, victims out there. It's hard to believe. Again, I've been a priest now for almost 50 years. This was happening during this last 50 years. I was totally unaware of it. I mean, it just, uh, it's only into the 90s that it started becoming more public knowledge, but from 70 to 90, that's 30, 20 years. No, no understanding of what uh, that could have been. I, it's really, uh, it's really something. What happens when a, a person comes to the reconciliation board and, and the person they're accusing has been deceased, maybe long deceased? How do they, uh, how do you, how does the board handle something like that? Well, again, obviously you can't question the deceased, but again, the, what evidence is, is presented is evaluated and uh, normally uh, sometimes uh, there's some collaboration from other, other people. So uh, it usually gets resolved. It be just because the person is deceased doesn't mean that they don't have a case for some kind of compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, <clears throat> I know you meet with uh, many victims yourself personally. And uh, you know a lot of this is about finding justice for people who have been wounded. Uh, how do you, what do you say to these people when they come and they sit and they speak with you and they tell you about some of these things yeah. that have happened to them? You only could say in the name of the church and in my own name, you know, that we're sorry for what happened and trying to make amends, trying to give people uh, courage and hope uh, to, uh, to keep looking to the future. You can't look back. Uh, that usually doesn't help us. Uh, looking back on the past, our past hurts, and, 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 but looking forward to the future, looking to look at life differently, that's what you try to encourage people mm -hmm. to do. Is justice being served here, do you think? Well, it's hard to say. Justice and mercy are uh, that needed to be blended with mercy also. And, uh, you know, we have a great gift of uh, being able to, f to, uh, to, to move on as human beings, not to be stuck in one place. So it's a difficult uh, thing to do. But uh, we need all the, the assistance that people can get to uh, look at their life in a positive way. Okay, Bishop, we'll be watching this as the year uh, goes on. Thank you so much for being with us today. And now we're going back to the news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. Many vital resources about the Child Victims Act and details about what the diocese is doing to protect children and combat abuse are available at thedioceseofbrooklyn.org. Click on Clergy Sex Abuse Crisis Response. The United States is currently ensnarled in a debate over the conditions of immigration detention facilities. A debate that shows no sign of slowing down as violence and poverty in Central America continues to send refugees and migrants northward. For the first time in months, a center in McAllen, Texas, is just under capacity. Sydney Hernandez has a rare look inside the borderland's busiest facility. Adequately needed. The main facility where thousands of migrants are held is not as overcrowded and controversial as once seen. Officials say that's because apprehensions are going down. But even with a slight decrease since June, the center is still busy. We will make sure that they don't have any contagious diseases. If they do have fever, uh, we will make sure that we take the appropriate steps to be able to treat them. If there is an emergency which our uh, providers are not able to handle, we will call the ambulance, we'll call 911, and we will uh, transport them over to the hospital. After being medically cleared when they enter, the migrants are given food and snacks. Some crackers, we'll give them some juices. We'll also give them a Maillard blanket just to make sure that they cover themselves. In addition to that, because we don't know when was the last time that they were actually received a shower, we will make sure that we give them shower wipes. They'll be able to wipe themselves down 
In the immediate time, while well, we're able to put them into, into the shower so that they can actually take a shower. Agents who run the center say migrants shower every 72 hours at the minimum. The agency also provides them with clean clothes. While their clothes is being washed and they're taking a shower, we make sure that we, we give them uh, a pant, we give them shirts, we give them underwear, we give them bras. All of these are stuff that we purchase for them and that we, we provide for them. The fencing many refer to as cages remain all throughout the facility, but agents say there's a reason for the design. I can assign an agent and he's able to see four or five cells down uh, versus if we had solid walls, I would have to add uh, additional um, personnel just to be able to, to man uh, and make sure that everybody is, is safe. During their time in custody, all migrants are given phone calls to contact family and speak to their consulates. The migrants, as you saw, are, are well taken care of. You saw multiple juveniles uh, watching television, watching cartoons, um, and interacting in a, a safe, secure, and very clean uh, facility. In the month of July, 72,000 immigrants were apprehended along the southwest border. Still to come on Currents News. It's a good, great country, and you should save it. His hands have held military medals from the Second World War, but now they finally hold a high school diploma. We have the story of one American hero and the achievement of his life. Looking at his diploma, he just kept saying he never thought he would really graduate high school. Instead of finishing his education, Margaret Quinn Livin says her father Joe dropped out of school. It was 1942 and World War II was raging. So instead of moving the tassel on his high school graduation cap, he put on a steel helmet and defended our country. Now this Catholic American hero is getting what he always wanted. Emily Druby reports. In Joseph Quinn Livin's Brooklyn home sits a plaque that reads, Freedom is not free. It's something the World War II vet understands well. It's a good, great country, and you should save it. At just 16 years old, Joe left high school to help his family get through the Great Depression. Two years later, in 1944, he enlisted in the Navy. Where I lived, everybody, everybody went into the service. He was stationed in the Pacific. Well, a couple of air raids, but... Uh, the planes got stopped before they uh, reached where we were. During the two years he spent fighting for his country, Joe was awarded many medals for bravery, but there's one recognition he never received, a high school diploma. My father worked very hard his whole life. Any overtime he could get to provide us with what we needed, and it was hard for him because he didn't you know, have those degrees. That is until now. How do you feel? feel good. His daughter, Margaret Quinlivan, explains her family surprised him this past Father's Day. We just put the cap and gown on him. He didn't know why. And, we, and then my, my brother presented him with a diploma and read it. And he was very happy. The family using a national program called Operation Recognition, which allows World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans to earn high school diplomas if they left school without graduating. Margaret says it was pretty easy to complete the process. And based on Joe's reaction, well worth it. I was surprised and I was glad, you know, so it was nice, you know. Education and the Catholic faith have always been pillars of the Quinlivan family. Several of Joe's kids even became Catholic school teachers, making this honor even more special. Looking at his diploma, he just kept saying he never thought he would really graduate high school. And it was just a, a nice moment for him because he made sure all of us graduated high school and he wanted all of us to go to, on to college and to have an easier and better life. Joe proving you're never too old to receive your high school diploma. In Sheepshead Bay, Emily Druby, Currents News. That is Currents News. I'm Tamara Lane. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.